You will hear a woman being interviewed by a market researcher in a health club about her membership of the club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, excuse me. I wonder if you'd have the time to take part in some market research. Um, what's it about? About this club and your experiences and opinions about being a member. It'll take less than five minutes. Oh, OK then, as long as it's quick. Can I start by taking your name? It's Selina Thompson. Is that T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N? Yes. Okay. Great, thanks. And what do you do for a living? Well, I'm an accountant, but I'm between jobs at the moment. I understand, but that's the job I'll put down on the form. And would you mind my asking which age group you fall into? Below 30, 31 to 50, and above? Over 50, <laughs> I think we can safely say. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And which type of membership do you have? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean how long... Of no, is it a single person membership? Oh, right, no, it's a family membership. <laughs> thanks. And... How long have you been a member? Ooh, let me see. Uh, I was certainly here five years ago, and it was probably two to three years more than that. Mm -hmm. Shall I put down eight? Oh, I remember now. It's nine, definitely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. I've got that. And the last question in this first part is, what brought you to the club? Uh, sorry? Uh, how did you find out about the club? Did you see any ads? Well, I, I did, actually. But I have to say, I wasn't really attracted to the club because of that. It was through word of mouth. So you were recommended by a friend? <laughs> actually, my doctor. Oh. I'd been suffering from high blood pressure, and he said the club was very supportive of people with that condition, so I signed up. Mm, great. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation... You have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, for the second part of the form, I want to ask a bit more about your experience of the club. Sure. Uh, how often would you say you use the club? <sighs> it varies enormously, depending on how busy I am. Mm, of course. But on average, per month? I'd say it averages out at twice a week. OK, so eight on average. Yeah, and four of those are aqua aerobics classes. That leads me to the next question. Would you say the swimming pool is the facility you make most use of? Fair to say that, yep. Right, thanks. And are there any facilities you don't use? Hmm. One area I realise I've never used is the tennis courts. Mm. And there's one simple reason for that. You don't play tennis? <laughs> Actually, I'm not bad at it. Oh. It's that I'm not happy having to pay extra for that privilege. Oh, right. I've made a note of that. Thanks. Mm. <clears throat> now, in the last section, are there any suggestions or recommendations you have for improvements to the club? Only about health and fitness? Anything at all. Well, 
I'd like to see more social events. Oh. It isn't just a question of getting together for games or classes, but other things, you know. Yes, yeah, sure. And another thing that I was thinking when I had my yoga class in the gym last night, we were all sweltering in the heat, uh, was that I think they should put in, well, you know... Uh, Air conditioning. Uh, that's exactly what I mean. Mm. The rooms are really light and well-designed, but they do need proper installations. Sure. Well, I've made a note of that. Good. So, is there anything else you'd like to suggest? Uh, about quality of service, for example? Oh, everyone's very nice here. They couldn't be more friendly and helpful. Oh, but I tell you what, it's a shame the restaurant isn't open in the evening on Saturday. And Sunday as well, for that matter. Oh. So the club should... You open it later on those days. OK. Well, thank you very much. That's <laughs> all the questions I have. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions 11 to 20. You now have some time to read questions 11 to 20 first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university. So make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area the place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk, near Closed Reserve. Closed Reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on Closed Reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level 2 only. On level 2 are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the audio-visual resource centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. Next to the Audio Visual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. 
There are 15 copiers for student use, and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Peter Walsh being interviewed for a job. Listen and choose the correct answer for each question. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Joanne! Hi, you must be Rob. Nice to meet you. So, I hear you're planning to visit Australia. Yeah, and I really wanted to talk to you because I was thinking of spending some time in Darwin and my sister told me you're from there. That's right. So, tell me about it. Well... Where shall I start? Well, Darwin's in what they call the top end, because it's right up at the northern end of Australia, and it's quite different from the rest of Australia in terms of cultural influences. In fact, it's nearer to Jakarta in Indonesia than it is to Sydney, so you get a very strong Asian influence there. That means we get lots of tourists. People from other parts of Australia are attracted by this sort of international cosmopolitan image. And as well as that, we've got the same laid-back atmosphere you get all over Australia. Probably more so, if anything, because of the climate. But what a lot of the tourists don't realize until they get there is that the city's also got a very young population. The average age is just 29, and this makes the whole place very buzzy. Some people think that there might not be that much going on as far as art, music, dancing, and so on are concerned, because it's so remote. I mean, we don't really get things like theater and opera in the same way as cities down in the south, like Sydney, for example, because of the transport expenses. But in fact, what happens is that we just do it ourselves— Lots of people play music, classical as well as pop, and there are things like artist groups and writers groups and dance classes. Everyone does something. 
We don't just sit and watch other people. You said it's very international. Yeah. They say there are over 70 different nationalities in Darwin. For instance, there's been a Chinese population there for over 100 years. We've even got a Chinese temple. It was built way back in 1887, but mm, when a very bad storm, uh, a cyclone in fact, hit Darwin in the 1970s, it was almost completely destroyed. The only parts of the temple that survived were part of the altars and the stone lions, but after the storm, they reconstructed it using modern materials. It's still used as a religious center today, but it's open to tourists too, and it's definitely worth going to see it. Oh, and as far as getting around goes, you'll see the places that advertise bicycles for hire, but I wouldn't recommend it. A lot of the year, it's just so hot and humid. Some tourists think it'll be fine because there's not much in the way of hills and the traffic's quite light compared with some places, but believe me, you're better off with public transport. It's fine and not expensive. Or you can hire a car, but it's not really worth it. What's the swimming like? Well, there are some good beaches, but the trouble is that there's this nasty creature called the box jellyfish, and if it stings you, you're in bad trouble. So you have to be very careful most of the year, especially in the winter months. You can wear a lycra suit to cover your arms and legs, but I wouldn't like to risk it even so, personally. And there are the saltwater crocodiles, too. I mean, I don't want to put you off. There are protected swimming areas netted off where you'll be safe from jellyfish and crocs, or there are the public swimming pools. They're fine, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And answer the questions. Please sit down, Mr. Walsh. My name's Jane Swain, and I'm the personnel manager. Hello, how do you do? Now, this is just a short preliminary interview. I'd like to chat about your present job and what you've done up till now. Yes, of course. Well, could you tell me how long you've had your present position in Weston's? It is Weston's, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Um, I am not sure. Let's see. I left university in 2005. Is that right? Yes, 2005. Then I was unemployed for about three months. And then I traveled round America for a few months. So, yes... It must be about three years now, in fact. Hmm, yes. And have you any particular reason for wanting to change jobs? I mean, why do you want to move? Well, I actually like my present job and still find it interesting and stimulating. The salary's okay, so it's nothing to do with money, though you can always do with more. I suppose the thing is that I'm really very ambitious and keen to get promoted so that's the real reason. You say you like your job. Can you tell me what aspect you like most? Oh, my dear, that's difficult. There are so many things. The other people are great. There's a good cooperative atmosphere. I mean, among the staff, and compared to other companies, the conditions are great. I mean, the office itself and the working conditions. Hmm. And then there's the fact that they give me lots of room for initiative and let me make decisions. You know, that's what I really like most about the job. Yes, well, we're looking for someone like that. You know, someone who isn't a clock watcher and who isn't too concerned about working fairly long hours. Oh, I don't mind that. I'm used to it. And what about your education? You went to Manchester University, didn't you? Uh, yes. 
After leaving school, I started a diploma course in design, but I decided to give it up and did an arts degree at university instead. Good. And have you done any courses since? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, Perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers, to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. 
and workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full- and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.